Minister Ishwaran, uh, Chairman Mr. N.K. Singh, uh, distinguished guests and friends. Um, let me just make a few remarks uh, so that we can get into discussion, uh, which I'm sure uh, would be much more interesting to all of you. Uh, but, but just to get us started, uh, my key point is really that in the end, what matters most is the external markets. There are about four or five major cases of very rapid growth, uh, growth which transformed the economies in a matter of two to three decades. And these are starting from Japan, uh, followed by uh, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, and the latest one, China. In every one of these cases, the role of the external markets, the role of the exports is absolutely pivotal. Uh, and there are various ways to slice each of these cases, uh, but if you take out the role played by the exports and the uh, 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 world markets, uh, I think each of these cases actually really would collapse. Uh, it, it, it was in this sense very pivotal. I will submit that this remains true for India as well. Uh, one of the key factors today, I think, is which, which is uh, largely missing from the Indian economy is the scale uh, on which our largest firms operate. In fact, in many of the sectors, we have simply no large firms, uh, or, or barely there. Uh, and and the, the sector that comes to mind uh, most immediately is the clothing industry, uh, which uh, in India consists of swath of uh, very, very small firms. A simple comparison, in India, uh, about 95% uh, uh, of the workforce in apparel industry is concentrated in small firms, which is less than 50 workers each. In China, uh, about 70% uh, 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 or more of the apparel workforce is in large or medium firms. And of course, the Chinese large firms are much bigger than the Indian large firms. Uh, when it comes to scale, we simply miss out. But make no mistake, even in India, successful industries are those where large firms are present. You can look at auto, engineering goods industries, pharmaceuticals, software industry. Every one of the successful industries has large firms. Uh, and when there are large firms present, of course, small and medium firms do well also. Uh, and, and that uh, one can see very readily in the predictivity uh, of the large and small firms. In sectors where large firms are present, predictivity, the average labor productivity is significantly higher. I mean, so relative to the large firms, uh, the medium and small firms also do very well. In firms, in, in industries, in sectors where large firms are missing, uh, you see that the average predictivity in, in, in small and medium firms also lags. Uh, and, and there's a good reason for it. The ecosystem is defined by the large firms. Uh, they are hooked up into the world markets. Uh, they are the ones uh, which uh, must paddle extremely hard to remain competitive in the world markets. And that kind of then at home defines the ecosystem. And they then, uh, in, in effect, demand similar productivity levels from the small and medium firms, uh, either as their competitors or as the uh, uh, firms to which the small and medium firms are uh, suppliers of inputs. Uh, so I think that is very critical. Uh, uh, and that is a lesson. I think there is something uh, 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 about which the private sector needs to worry as much as the government it, uh, uh, too. Uh, government in terms of the policies that would foster, uh, the, the, uh, facilitate the emergence of large firms. But the industry mindset also in India, I think, particularly in these employment intensive industries, which are now so critical for India, uh, has been uh, uh, defined by the small scale industries as stringent labor laws, et cetera. And so that even though today, actually, there is no small-scale industry reservation, uh, and at least in some states like Gujarat, uh, you can find 
very flexible labor laws as well, uh, you don't see the large firms emerging in those sectors. I think that really needs to change. Uh, this is part of the reason I've been advocating very much and, and, and pushing for uh, some coastal employment zones. Uh, also, that ties into the fact that you know, uh, uh, if, you, if, uh, if you are large, you are going to operate in the world markets, and that, of course, means a coastal location uh, is going to generally help. And, and that, again, is something you can observe uh, in, in, in the history of all the far, uh, rapidly expanding economies that I mentioned earlier. Uh, now, there is some skepticism today both coming from the what is going on in the global economy and what is going on in the technology field uh, towards this uh, sort of export-oriented, uh, a global uh, economy-oriented model. Uh, uh, the, on, on, on the global market side, the fear is that you know pr uh, there is there is going there is some protectionist backlash in some of the countries, uh, which might render uh, 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 invalid. Uh, the, the export-oriented market, uh, which uh, propelled the growth in uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, and China. Uh, I would submit, actually, that you know, today the global market is so large. After all, the base matters, global market today, uh, even after very slow growth or even actually actual decline in the export market in, for a couple of years, uh, it is still a $16 trillion market. Uh, India's share in that market is just 1.7%. Uh, it is tiny compared to that Chinese share. This is only merchandise exports. I'm not even counting services, which is another five to $6 trillion. Uh, and to that, compare that India's economy today total, in total is $2 trillion, of which less than $1 trillion actually is the goods market. So you're comparing a $16 trillion market to something that is less than a $1 trillion market. Uh, and not to mention the fact that if you actually conquer the world markets, you automatically con would conquer your domestic market. That is, if you're competitive in the global markets, you will certainly be competitive in the domestic market as well. So I think uh, uh, going forward, even if protection on the margins impacts the size of this market, it remains uh, an, an incredibly large market. Uh, and, and therefore, I think what matters a lot more uh, is not what happens in that market, but what we do domestically here to ensure that we become globally competitive. I think in the end, our global competitiveness uh, is going to determine what we can do, do in the global economy. On the technology side, certainly there are uh, uh, challenges ahead, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, that challenge can be overstated. Uh, uh, in the end, because something can be done in a lab sort of conditions, because something can be done uh, at the innovation level, doesn't necessarily mean that it will result in commercial success. Surely, in a lot of the sectors, this is happening. Commercial successes are also happening. But in some of the sectors where actually we ought to be present big time, uh, uh, even at the laboratory stage, uh, things are uh, not quite uh, there. Uh, uh, clothing industry is clearly one of those. Uh, uh, you know, the, the process of uh, stitching two pieces of cloth is still far uh, from the capability of robots to do. Uh, uh, some experiments I have seen, but nothing that is anywhere near commercialization. Uh, so still, clothing industry uh, is likely to be done for the at least next 10 to 15 years by the human hands, and that is a window that is long enough for India. So again, I sort of return to the theme that in the end, what we do here uh, is what is going to matter uh, the most. And, and this is where I hope our industry will also think a bit harder. Uh, uh, what uh, I have noticed actually in my two and a half years at the Niti Aayog is that there is huge kind of you know, uh, 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 tendency, not just on the part of us, the policymakers, but also the, on the part of the industry to look to the domestic market largely. And that, of course, leads to the demands for uh, uh, and sometimes grant of it uh, for protectionist policies that secure the domestic market for the domestic industry. Uh, and sometimes we, often, we, we end up providing such high 
level of protection, uh, uh, and, and that may take the form of trade protection or of uh, subsidies. Um, uh, 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 that, in the end, you make it profitable for even smaller, uh, 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 less efficient manufacturers to get into the market. And the market that emerges then is a, is, is, is a collection of small firms, each of which uh, is, it becomes competitive in the domestic market, but really, at the end of the day, is not competitive globally. Uh, and the scale that is actually required, ultimately, to become globally competitive is not achieved. So I think we do need to remain open. Uh, uh, open the economy further, uh, and uh, the industry needs to think uh, a lot more in terms of scale than it does. Domestic market is not uh, uh, the, the, uh, the ultimate. The ultimate really is the global economy. That is where uh, we really need to be in action. That 1.7% share in the, global, uh, uh, in the global export market for goods has to rise up to at least 4 or 5%. If we could get even there in the next 10 years, that would certainly uh, uh, do wonders. Just as a last uh, point, uh, let me uh, say that uh, uh, in India, actually, particularly in the area of education, uh, both school education and higher education, we really have got a very long way to go. Uh, indeed, the quality of education has been declining. Uh, uh, we need to arrest that, reverse that, uh, particularly at least the foundational learning is very important. Even if skills are to be imparted, absent foundational learning, even skills cannot be imparted. So I think that remains a huge challenge. The present government, I'm very glad, has made some changes in the school uh, uh, education policy, uh, requiring the performance of the students to be uh, measured. Uh, as opposed to what we had under the Right to Education Act originally. Uh, that is a hugely important uh, uh, step, uh, but we have to continue further reforms in that direction. On higher education, we need to build top-class universities. Uh, I think you know, we, uh, Singapore uh, offers a very good example. China offers a very good example. Uh, we need to start building up at least you know, two or three world-class universities, uh, uh, which then can also lead not only uh, the, the, the uh, innovation and entrepreneurship uh, in, in the country, but also uh, 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 build up the, the necessary uh, 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 background for more serious uh, uh, research on, on in, in which India has uh, been uh, on the forefront. Uh, so with that, uh, let me uh, conclude. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I was listening with great attention uh, to the remarks of Mr. Panagaria, the Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog, and in fact, trying to find some common grounds between your two remarks. It seems to me when we are talking about the role that the private sector has to play in being a growth driver, of course, with the support of government policies. I think I would like to, in a way, draw attention to what I think today are three key powers that the private sector leaders uh, need to have. And again, I will draw on the remarks of our two keynote speakers. It seems to me that the first power that private sector leaders need to have or need to stimulate and engineer is knowledge power. But it is not any kind of academic knowledge power. It has to be knowledge power directed to innovation. It has to be knowledge power generating new skills. And it has to be knowledge power oriented toward wealth creation. So what is required is a very special kind of knowledge power which is what we need today. 
And when we speak about knowledge and innovation, it doesn't have to be necessarily breakthrough innovation. We have seen, for instance, with the tremendous success that we have witnessed in China, that incremental innovation can be extremely uh, productive in terms of generating growth and further innovation. So we have to be very aware that there are breakthrough innovation, but they don't happen so frequently. And what is even more important is incremental permanent innovation. Let me turn very rapidly to the second power that leaders need to have, private sector leaders need to have, which is what I call networking power. Today, you are worth the networks you belong to. This has tremendous implication because, in a way, the ICT revolution allows for the creation of networks and the leveraging of networks in a way which is unprecedented. And business leaders who cannot leverage or are not able to leverage fast enough the kind of opportunities that are created by the ICT revolution to create and be part of multi-dimensional networks, whether it is in terms of supply chains, as we have seen, we have heard Minister Iswaran mention, whether it is creating of networks that will allow them in a way to create scale dimensions, economies of scale, whether it is networks that would allow them to create a kind of very strong interlocutors able to reduce cost uh, with their suppliers and so on and so forth. But at the national and international level, it means being able to leverage and create trade and business networks. We have heard about the risk that globalization might be in retreat. Uh, in fact, I would, I would consider that globalization is not in retreat. We are looking at a pause in the way globalization has been operating. But what counts is that while the era of multilateral, new multilateral trade agreement is over. What is important today is to create new networks of regional trade agreements. Uh, because these are the trade agreements which truly work. Of course, there are some very successful examples of bilateral trade agreements. But more and more, we see that in terms of efficiency, you need to be part of regional trade network. And then let me come to the third power, which is what I call the transformative action power. There are quite a number of leaders in the political area of the private sector who are action-oriented. You hear that all the time. Action is good. Transformative action is better. And in that respect, getting back to the concerns that we have today relating to the way globalization might be uh, facing new obstacles relating to the fact that we are concerned about the surge of protectionism or populism that we see in different parts of the world. I think we have today the need and the urgency for transformative action 
in terms, as has been mentioned, of making globalization more inclusive. In fact, if I may, and I will use the next two minutes, I think, as I said, we are not in retreat. We are just in a pause as we are entering what I call globalization 3.0. Globalization 1.0 was when people felt or thought that globalization will be synonymous with Americanization. And when the developed countries thought that globalization was just a way for them to find new markets. Globalization 2.0 was when developed countries and the middle classes in the developed countries realized with a lot of fear and concern that globalization was becoming a two-way street, that they would see competition from new players and that this competition with, with, uh, was putting in danger the acquired advantages of a traditional middle class. At the same time, there was the realization that globalization was not, definitely not, Americanization, but it would be a multifaceted globalization with a Chinese version of globalization, a European version of globalization, an Asian version of globalization, a Russian version of globalization, an American version of globalization. And then we are entering phase three, 3.0. What is it? It is the fact that we need to find ways to address the disturbing impact, the dislocating impact of globalization, not only in the developed world, but also in the emerging market where, of course, very large segments of the population have benefited from that. And here, the business sector has a key role to play. Of course, government policies need to alleviate the dislocating impact of globalization. But at the same time, I think what I would call the arrogance of the business establishment, especially in the developed countries, about how we are going to benefit from globalization, how business today has been to be the driver, and the government are also almost becoming obsolete. This kind of arrogance has to, in a way, make place to a new kind of attitude where the management of globalization become important. So this is the point that I wanted to make.